Well, guys, I think it's just going to be you and me on this one. I do not anticipate this becoming a viral video by any stretch of imagination. Probably won't get a lot of views on this. We're going to talk about some really pretty high-level stuff here. This video is only going to be useful if you are fairly advanced and have a very solid understanding of fuel trims. So I'm going to get that out of the way. If you want to do the background on that, I've got a link to a video in the description, the most important video, I think on my channel, Secret of Engine Problem Diagnosis Fuel Trims. If you understand that stuff and you're very solid on it, only then is this video going to make sense. As a do-it-yourselfer, honestly, this is way beyond what most people will do. And including myself as a do-it-yourselfer, I'm limited in how much time I spend on really high-level expert material like this. But the reason I'm doing this is because many people had some really good questions in my previous video on diagnosing the Jeep, which we're, we're still in progress of, actually. And it seemed that there were some contradictions with my conclusions looking at the fuel trims in that video, as opposed to in the primer diagnosis and understanding of fuel trims. For example, I completely dismissed an oxygen sensor as being a potential problem in that vehicle, despite the fact that I could not get the oxygen sensor to go rich even with propane. Why did I not consider the oxygen sensor in that case? And the answer is because of the material that I will show you in this video. It will also help you to understand a lot of the questions I get. Why do sometimes I look at short-term fuel trims? Sometimes I look at long-term fuel trims. How come when other people reproduce some of the things that I've shown, they don't see consistent results? Sometimes I don't see consistent results, but I don't worry about it um, because I understand where that inconsistency is coming from. It's pretty advanced stuff, so not a lot of joking around in this one, but uh, like I said, you will need a solid understanding of fuel trims for this to be useful. So uh, let's go ahead to the dry erase board of knowledge. We're going to start off with two major questions that were asked that really stemmed my um, reasoning for doing this video because, you know, I really only want to go so far. I don't want to lose the do it yourself or crowd. But the truth is, a lot of you guys are getting really advanced with this, and it's the only way I can answer some of your questions is by taking it to the next level. That's what we're going to do. So let's see how this goes. So we're going to preface this, as I said, with two questions that up until now, we wouldn't be able to answer based on our knowledge of fuel trims and everything. And some of the stuff in the Jeep video I did before this one seemed to be contradictory to what I was saying. And one uh, very longtime contributor to the channel, Cyril Bus, asked a very good question. It'll be the first question we're going to preface this video with. Why did I dismiss oxygen sensors in the Jeep video when I could not get them to go rich, even with propane? And it's a great point. He's referring to the fact that in my diagnosis and understanding of fuel trims video, I show how to test oxygen sensor operation by inducing lean variables and rich variables. One way is with propane. I did that on this Jeep. The Jeep did not respond to the propane, and yet, I did not consider oxygen sensors even for a second as a problem. Why was that the case? That will become apparent. The other question was actually a very simple but profound question. Well, kind of. Um, I, I won't name the person, but he basically asked, why would we ever see a change in short-term fuel trims? That was his question. And of course, referring to if you have a check engine light and you look on your scan tool and you've got the engine running and you look at your fuel trims, by definition, if you've got a check engine light, then the long-term fuel trim has obviously set. So you would expect the short-term fuel trims to be at zero. Why would you see a variability in short-term fuel trims? Absolutely profound question. It turns out he was actually literally asking, like, what would cause change in short-term fuel trims? In other words, he didn't know fuel trims. Um, so I didn't catch that at the time. But if you do know fuel trims, it, it actually does become a very profound question. That will also become apparent in our discussion here. So as I have stated, if you do not understand fuel trims and O2 sensor operation, uh, I'm sure I've lost you already. But if you're still hanging in there, I'm pretty sure it won't be for long. So watch the previous video, learn up on that really well, and then come back. But if you don't believe me, let's get started.
So let's start with the most basic foundation that we learned from the diagnosis of fuel trims video. And let's, as an example, use a four cylinder engine that we know has a vacuum leak. So let's uh, say that we don't even have a check engine light on it. It doesn't matter, but known vacuum leak. So we go ahead, we idle the car and we get a long term fuel trim of, let's say, 15. We know what our short-term fuel trim is going to be. It should, of course, be zero. If and and you know zero plus or minus five because we're getting the oscillation with the O2 sensor. If you don't agree with this, go back to that video. We also know that on our O2 sensor, we are going to see our oscillation trace because the long-term fuel trim has set the baseline so that the short-term fuel trim can maintain stoic with the O2 sensor. We know this. This should be very obvious and basic to you. Now, here's the thing is that um, we know how this happened. We know how this happened. And just as a quick review, uh, we had our O2 sensor going along really good. Uh, let's say we introduce a vacuum leak. The vacuum leak, of course, causes O2 sensor to go lean. Short-term fuel trim will increase, causing the addition of fuel. Obviously, the short-term fuel trim must have gone up to 15 before we return to stoic. And then, of course, that sets the long-term fuel trim at 15 which means the short-term fuel trim no longer has to call for fuel. It's going to be at zero, O2, and stoic. That's how that works. So we, that's how our long-term, of course, got set to 15. Here is the important thing. This is the critical thing, okay? All of that, and, and of course, we're at idle, right? So we're at 800 RPM, okay? All of that is applicable only under this specific condition with the engine RPM at 800 and then also with some type of load condition, uh, maybe determined from a map sensor or something. But the thing is, is that that fuel trim setting of 15 is set for the engine conditions at idle. Okay, it is not across the board and everything. Now, let's do this. So we know one of the things that we do to look for this vacuum leak is we know that at idle, 800 RPM or so, our long-term fuel trim is at 15. And then what do we do? Well, we know as we increase the RPM, and let's say we increase RPM right here to 2200 RPM, and we see that the long-term fuel trim now goes back to zero. So the thing is, is that obviously we understand why that's happening because the vacuum leak is not contributing so much to the airflow coming into the engine because we've got the throttle open. So the thing is, is that the long-term fuel trim set here at zero because that condition, that specific condition at 2200 RPM with the car not moving, has that long-term fuel trim already memorized at zero. So we're starting to get a little pattern here. We have this memorized condition at idle. We also have a long-term fuel trim memorized at this specific condition. And actually, it's memorized at all of these conditions in between. So. These individual conditions like that are known as fuel cells. And the way that it actually looks is like this. It's actually an array. It, it, when I look at this, it kind of reminds me back in the 80s when I learned basic computer programming. Maybe some of you guys remember that. And you've got your dimensional arrays. So you would set variables within an array like this. And that's exactly how the computer memorizes that long-term fuel trim. As you remember, I said the long-term fuel trim is a learned response to a condition. This is where that learned response is stored, in this array in the PCM. So when the engine is under specific conditions, it, it doesn't just look at the conditions and then just fix it. It recognizes it's in that condition and it refers to this map called an adaptive cell memory map, a block learn map, an adaptive fuel strategy. There's all kinds of names for this, but what it does is it looks 
at this map and pulls from it at 800 with, say, a 10% load at idle, it's going to pull that 15% fuel trim from there. Now, of course, as we increase, we might see different numbers here. Whatever it may be. Obviously, there's a difference with the car being at idle at a low load versus if the car was driving. If the car was driving, we may see completely different numbers here. Certainly, while the car is driving under load, we would not see any effect from the vacuum leak. So we would see long-term fuel trims at pretty much normal. So and this load percent thing is a little bit confusing. It looks like 50% load. The engine's at 50% of its capability. It doesn't quite work that way. But the important thing is we can see that we could fill in this map with all kinds of numbers. Obviously, if for whatever reason uh, the engine is under a 40% load, maybe we turn the air conditioner on or something like that, then of course the IAC opens. So we might expect a little bit less of a long-term fuel trim, even though the engine's idling. So we may have a fuel map that looks, I don't know, something like this, I'm sure, while driving the car is going to be, you know, maybe there's some variability here just a little bit. And we can see we can fill in this map. So if the car is, say, at 2800 RPM under 50% load, it knows it does not need to make a fuel adjustment because it's looking at the map and pulling a zero long-term fuel trim, no adjustments necessary. When the car returns back to idle at a stoplight, it sees it's at that condition, it looks at the fuel map, it should be 15, so it sets the fuel accordingly. So this is a very important concept to learn, um, and it's actually a little more involved than this. So hopefully, and I'm sorry if I'm not doing a good job of explaining this, but it's a, it's a very difficult concept to understand, but this is important because understanding how the computer is getting its fuel strategy information under certain conditions affects how you want to set up your scan tool and how you interpret your long-term and fuel trim. Now, I don't want to go too much into this. This is, this is really more Scanner Danner's realm, so I'm going to let him take it over that. But I, I just want you to understand one thing, that this map is not two-dimensional. And, and I don't know how far this map goes on the X and Y axis here. I believe that it goes uh, across like, I think, 20 spaces, if I remember correctly. I really don't remember. But it, it's a pretty decent-sized map to cover a very large range of possible conditions and know what the fuel trim would be in each of those conditions. But actually, it's, it's not quite as simple as this. The map actually looks more like this. And I'm sorry about my drawing here. I'm, I'm going to try to do the best I can. But the thing is, is that this two-dimensional map is actually stacked with many other maps in a... This is your uh, y-axis here. This is your x-axis here. But there's also a z-axis. So there is another map stacked on top of this. And this Z map, um, I, I don't know what the variables are used on different cars. I know like on my Trans Am, for example, it, it's going to be with the map sensor. But using that example, as the map increases, or in other words, as load increases, then a new two-dimensional map is used for that condition. And this can stack up fairly high as well. So it's sort of a cube. It's in three dimensions. So where is it idle with very low loads and everything? You'll have your fuel trims down in this base here. As the map increases, you'll introduce a new set of fuel trims that may be totally different. So you may have 10 here instead of 15 uh, just at base idle. And you may still have zeros here. Maybe under load, there's some other thing. And you may find that under another layer way up high with the map sensor that you may start having problems and you start seeing higher fuel trims when the car is under load. So it can get pretty complicated. Now, just to keep this simple, we're going to just deal with a two-dimensional level just for demonstration. But do know that it, it varies with the map sensor. So in other words, 
the fuel trim would be different if you were, say, at in Florida, and then you decided to drive up to Denver and bring the car to me, we would see the fuel map adjust for the altitude, and while you still have a vacuum leak, we would see different fuel trim numbers than you would at sea level, because we would be pulling from a higher level array. Right. And actually, I think I said that backwards, didn't I? It, it would be uh, the map would read lower in Denver. Um, but whatever the, the point is, you, you see my point there, is that there is adaptation based on the different variables there. And that is how the computer learns these fuel strategies. So it's very important to understand this concept before we move forward here that let's draw this map here again. And I'm just going to draw a very simple one here. Oh, my marker's dying. Bummer. Sorry about that. The markers have limited capacity for knowledge, apparently. But it's very important. And let me just draw a very basic map here, because I don't want to keep drawing grids all the time. But let's just draw a very simple map here. And this would be load. And we have this very simple map with these long-term fuel trims assigned as learned over driving conditions for some time. And we go ahead and we diagnose our vehicle as we normally would. It comes in and we do our typical RPM here and our fuel trim here. And of course, the first thing we do is, of course, we start with a high fuel trim and then we hit the accelerator pedal and we look for that dip and then we let off on the pedal. It's important to see that what we're actually doing here is we're pulling for these conditions from an already established learn map. So it's not like a live activity that we're inducing here. It's already being pulled from this learn fuel map. So when we see this curve, what's actually happening is we're pulling the cells for these different conditions. And of course, for here, we would need more data on the map or maybe even another level on the map because obviously we were we would be in a decel condition here and that would be at a lower map load. So it may be even at a fuel cell map below this one possibly. But the point is, is that these numbers are getting pulled from somewhere. We're not actually generating new ones every time we hit the throttle. Why is that important to know? Well, here is a major reason. And this, by the way, will also answer the question, why would we see short-term fuel trims? So let's do this. Let's make a mistake here on our diagnosis. And it, I think that'll be a way that I can make it a little more clear and also reinforce what we already learned. So let's take that car with the vacuum leak and let's generate a fuel map here. Okay, and we're just going to use this bottom level, but basically, um, as we would expect, we can see, you know, if, if you could pull up a, a fuel map for a car, you wouldn't even need to do the actual throttle tests and everything. You could look at the fuel map and you can see this dip as the increase occurs, by the way. You could do that. I don't know of a way that you can pull a fuel map from a car, but we'll talk about the fuel map in your scan tool in a little bit because you don't really use the fuel map in a diagnosis. This is basically to help you understand what parameters to pull up for your fuel trim because you understand how that fuel trim got there. So it's not really used in a diagnosis. I've never looked at a car and said, oh, let's pull up whatever is in this particular fuel cell. You don't do that. Um, but it's important to understand this if you're really going to be advanced because of, of this right here, as a matter of fact. So we've got this vacuum leak in the car, and we're going to make this mistake here. We are going to put our um, RPM down here, and here we're going to put short-term fuel trim because we thought, well, we're going to go ahead and look for the vacuum leak, and because the short-term fuel trim is an immediate learned response, this would be the way to look at it. Well, it's not, because what we do when we look at our short-term fuel percent, um, let's put uh, zero up a little bit here. Okay, and then up here, let's put 25. And we go ahead and it, uh, let's put 800 RPM here, of course, and 1800 here. And we look at our short-term fuel trim and we see that there is no change whatsoever. So we pretty much rule out a vacuum leak is the problem because we did not see an improvement in the short-term fuel trim under load. Well, see, the problem is, is that if we had looked at long-term fuel trim, 
the long-term fuel trim, and I apologize, I should have made two different colors here, but you know, this is, it's complicated to keep this in mind here, but hopefully you see the long-term fuel trim numbers from the fuel map would have shown. See, remember, because the long-term has been set, the short-term fuel trim does not need adjustment because the car computer is not looking to the short-term fuel trim. It's looking to the long-term fuel trim. And as long as those O2 sensors are in stoic, it's not going to change it. The only way you would get a change in any one of these fuel cells is if during this condition, the O2 sensor was no longer in stoic, it went rich or lean, then at that, let's say that happened in this cell right here, that the O2 sensor suddenly went lean, well of course, over time, that long-term fuel trim is going to adjust higher because of course the short-term fuel trim is gonna call for fuel until that O2 gets in stoic, so it may decide this number now needs to be an eight, and that, would be the new learned long-term fuel trim in that cell. That's the way that the adaptation takes place. But you won't see that in this short-term fuel trim curve. You would see it in the long-term fuel trim curve. Now, let's do this. Let's make another mistake here. So in this situation, you fix the vacuum leak, and of course you go ahead and you clear the check engine light to reset it. But you also have to understand that that's also resetting your fuel map and setting all of your baselines back to zero. So then you go ahead and you run your test just to make sure that we've got it fixed. So we've got our RPM here, and of course we're smart now because we know from the previous example, oh, well we wanna use long-term fuel trim because because that's what the curve is actually drawing from is the long-term fuel trim from the adaptive memory cells. So we've got our long-term fuel trim here. And of course, we're at zero, and we go ahead and no matter what we do with the accelerator, we go ahead, we increase our RPM, and we stay pretty much at a zero long-term fuel trim, and we call that car fixed. But, had we looked at the short-term fuel trim, which is not drawn from this map, we would possibly see that as we increase this, the short-term fuel trim is actually very high. But as we increase, the short-term fuel trim improves, and these numbers here are still in learning. One of the things that may happen is you try this test again, and now, you start noticing that maybe it's a little bit higher up here and you start getting this variability. It's because there's still a learning going on. So it's very important to understand this so that you know when to use long-term, when to use short-term. Here's another example of a time you would wanna use short-term. So let's say we have this, where all of the fuel cells tend to have a high long-term fuel trim setting. A good reason this could happen, a bad fuel pump like in that Jeep. Um, and, and now, just think about that for you guys that saw the Jeep video. This, this is gonna answer Cyril's question, isn't it? But if you're not clear on that, we'll, we'll go into it. Uh, a dirty mass airflow sensor, too much air coming in at all times that's not being metered properly. So we have this condition right here. And one of the things that we might wanna do is let's go ahead and see if we can actually reverse this by adding propane. It's a good way to test our O2 sensor. Would we wanna use long-term fuel trim for that or would we wanna do that with short-term fuel trim? So we would definitely wanna do that one with short-term fuel trim. And then this would be the amount of propane here. And of course, with our high short-term fuel trims, as we add propane, we should see that short-term go down. Now, why do we wanna do short-term instead of long-term? Because long-term, if we were to do, oh, did I just do this backwards? I am sorry about that. <laughs> Let's put that in, in red. Okay, so the long-term fuel trim from the map here, the problem with that is it's gonna take a lot longer time for that to react because as we're adding the propane, of course this fuel map has never seen that before. So here we are idling, and remember all of this is going to take place in only one cell. It's not gonna take place in the map. So we're at idle, 
we're at 800 RPM, for that cell in that condition, the fuel trim for long term has been set at 15. But now we're adding propane. Well, that's that's a new thing for this thing. The O2 sensor is no longer in stoichiometry at that cell. So of course the short term fuel trim does its thing and this long term is going to start dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping however low it has to go to return that O2 sensor. So the thing is is that we'll see this instantly in real time with the short term but on some cars it may take a couple of minutes before we see it on the long term because the learning may take a long time so that would be an example of that there's another thing that can throw you off here too um, and again remember in this example this would only be in one cell that's adapting here but let's do an adapt adaptation that can get us in trouble across multiple cells now Okay, so let's look at this fuel map here. And we've got something kind of interesting in these two fuel cells under higher RPM and high load. And that is they don't match the rest of the map. So a reason that that could happen is maybe for whatever reason, there were never conditions met for those fuel cells to need to adjust a fuel trim. Uh, this may be something that you might find especially in a higher RPM but a low load because how many people hold their car at 3200 RPM when the car is parked? Pretty much only you're going to do that as part of a diagnostic. So that fuel cell may have never been used before and now it's being used for the first time. So when you do your RPM curve here and you're driving your RPM and you're looking at your long-term fuel trim. You go ahead and you run along and you see that no matter what you do with your RPM, it stays high and then all of a sudden it gets way better at the very end and you're thinking, ah, well, there it is. There you go. It finally improved over long-term. That is a vacuum leak. A little hard to find, but we got it. No, you didn't. The reason that that happened is because that cell has never been used before, so it's pulling that zero long-term fuel trim. Had you looked at the short-term fuel trim, you would have seen the short-term fuel trim would have increased dramatically, and that would have been a clue that this cell just simply has not learned yet. Okay, I hope that this is making sense to you guys. I really, I, I get the feeling I'm just talking to myself right now. But uh, if you're still hanging in with me, then man, um, I don't even know what to say. You guys need a life. But let's go ahead and let's uh, answer Cyril's question. And before I do that, let me refresh your memory on what happened here with this Jeep. Okay, so in this Jeep, we looked at our O2 sensor trace. And we'll just make one trace to make it simple. And the long-term fuel trim is redonkulous high. Um, I believe it was like 35 or something like that. So the long-term fuel trim is at 35. Uh, Short-term fuel trim was a little bit on the high side, I remember, but it was still within reason. It was about six or seven or so. So we've got this very, very high long-term fuel trim at 35, short-term fuel trim at six. And what did I do? Well, one of the things I wanted to do is under wide open throttle, we would of course expect the O2 sensors to go rich. They did not. They would not go rich. So just to verify that these oxygen sensors are actually working because I really wanted to see a rich response with the oxygen sensor just to verify it, I went ahead and I added propane right into the intake manifold. And what did we see? Well, we of course would have expected to see those O2 sensors go way rich, but they didn't. The O2 sensor continued on its merry way. We never saw the O2 sensor go rich. The reason that I did not put an oxygen sensor in that car, despite the fact that we could not get that O2 sensor going rich, is because I was thinking about the fuel map. So let's look at that. That fuel trim never went above 35. So let's think about what that fuel, tr fuel map looks like. See, the problem is, is that 35 is clearly a maximum. You have to cap off the long-term fuel trim at some point. Otherwise, you're just going to keep adding fuel and adding fuel and adding fuel, and eventually you're going to get liquid fuel out of the tailpipe because the injectors are never going to shut. They're going to be open all the time. So there's a limit on that. If the fuel map is maxed out, 
That is the reason why we did not go rich on the O2 sensors because this long-term fuel trim is so high that when we add this propane, it's kind of like giving a really, really thirsty guy a damp sponge. The amount of fuel that I'm adding in here is not nearly enough to compensate for that long-term fuel trim. So while we may have lowered these numbers a little more, it's still, even with my propane, it's still calling for the addition of fuel. The propane is not nearly enough to cause that O2 sensor to go rich because we're already in such a lean condition that more than compensates for the trickle of propane that I'm adding. So that is the reason why I did not consider an oxygen sensor because we were still getting switching. So I know that this has to be the reason because we're kind of at the cusp of the limit for the fuel trim. So hopefully that answers that question for you. So as far as uh, about the only other topic I can think of, because I, you know, again, I really don't want to go too much into this. This is really something if you're more like a automotive uh, technician student or something like that, but for your average do-it-yourselfer, this is way beyond what you need. But I know some of you guys are curious about this. And again, it's the only way I can answer some of those really good questions. But now hopefully you'll see when you're doing your diagnoses and you're thinking, well, should I do long-term or short-term? Uh, this is how I know which one I'm going to use and why. And a lot of times, of course, I always look at both the long-term and the short-term so that if I don't get an expected result with the long-term, but I see a result with the short-term, it gives me information on what the fuel map must be. And again, the other thing is I don't consider a fuel map as an actual diagnostic tool. You can see where maybe it could be useful. Typically on my scan tool, the most that I've ever seen that I can do is I can actually um, have the scan tool tell me what fuel cell is currently being used. It, it's useless, it doesn't matter. Even if it told me what fuel cell is being used and what the trim is in that particular cell, without having the map, it's really kind of useless. I, I guess maybe if you could get information on what the fuel trim is in that cell, it might be useful because if your scan tool is not reporting that same information, it may help indicate if you've got a communication issue, I guess. But as far as my experience with these fuel adaptive cell maps, it, it's really more to explain where my data is coming from and to consider that when I collect the data, but I don't actually use it as a diagnostic tool. So we're not going to be able to put this onto a car and actually show this working um, because my scan tool wouldn't give that information anyway. So anyway, bless you if you stayed through this with me, probably not one of the most exciting videos um, and actually maybe even not one of the most helpful, but for you guys that are really at the cream of the 2% crop, um, you know, this is one of the reasons reasons that I often dismiss things that you guys are like, whoa, 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 why are you not pursuing that? Th this is the reason why. So hopefully it'll make uh, viewing the videos a little more clear to you in the future. Well, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for your support. One thing you can really do, remember to like the videos. It really is one of the best and easiest ways to so show support for the channel. And I really appreciate that. So we'll see you next time, hopefully with some more information on that Jeep.